A satellite image of the Holy Land, peaceful and serene on a picture-perfect, cloudless day. A small piece of territory in comparison to many others, yet one that has an unusually rich history of conquest and dominion. It sits at one of the world's most significant geopolitical crossroads. Here, the nations have struggled for millennia, determined to have a place in this arena of world events. But it's not just in the realm of power and politics that this holy land has seen conflict. Jerusalem is home to three of the world's religions. It continues to invite our attention. Looking back over its religious history, you might say it's also a theological crossroads. When it comes to Christianity, there's an equally rich history of conflict and conquest. But what would the founder of Christianity have made of all of the blood spilled here, supposedly in his name? There is an immense contradiction between what he taught and all that has happened. What did the earliest teachers of Christianity have to tell their world? Does original Christianity still exist? Have Jesus' teachings enjoyed accurate transmission across the years? Or is the Christianity we know today, in part, accumulated misconception? New scholarship and the findings of archaeology are contributing to a realignment of thinking about the roots of the world's most widely distributed religion. Christianity now has over 1.7 billion adherents. Hello, I'm David Hume. Please join me for the next hour as we take a surprising and often revealing look at the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth and how we have misunderstood, misperceived, and misquoted the first Christians. We're up above the Hula Valley in northern Israel. This is the Muslim fortress of Nimrud in the foothills of Mount Hermon, close to today's borders with Lebanon and Syria. Built in the 1200s, it was designed as a protection against the European Crusaders. Beginning in 1095, the Pope had encouraged these religious warriors to take back the Holy Land from the Muslim Turks and restore it to Christendom. This fortress now stands a silent testimony to those blood-soaked times. The period of the Crusades was one that most would rather forget. It was a time of misguided fervor that has led some to conclude that Christianity lost its way a long time ago. But the Crusades are just one example over the past 2,000 years of how humans have contradicted early Christian teaching. In the 19th century, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said it well when he wrote, millions of people over the centuries have little by little cheated God out of Christianity. It's a shocking and bold statement. What did he mean by it and what can be done? Years later, in the second half of the 20th century, the French writer Jacques Ellul wrote, we have to admit that there is an immeasurable distance between all that we read in the Bible and the practice of Christians. These are not altogether uncommon thoughts. A lot of us suspect that something fundamental and vital has gone missing between the earliest days of Christianity and now. It's also a surprising fact that the Bible is the most misquoted and misunderstood book of all. 
This has led to many misconceptions. It's led to many of the Bible's stories being retold inaccurately. Kierkegaard made an even more telling remark when he said, the Christianity of the New Testament simply does not exist. If this is a true statement, then perhaps it's time to go back and rediscover the authentic faith. And here in the land where the New Testament began is the place for us to start. We begin with the most familiar account of all, the first Christmas, or was it? Could it be that we've got it significantly wrong? Every year in the closing days of December, the town of Bethlehem is filled with pilgrims, acknowledging what they believe was the time of their Savior's birth. But does the traditional Christmas story reflect what the Bible and certain facts of history tell us? You might be surprised. Two thousand years ago, the Mediterranean basin was a Roman-dominated world. Just before Jesus' birth, Roman records show that the Emperor Caesar Augustus issued a decree calling for a census. Nothing unusual in that, this Emperor had called for several such reckonings during his reign. This one was his last one and came in 8 BC. The next one came under a different Caesar, Tiberius, in 14 AD. Now the Romans allowed about five years for a census to be completed. The New Testament writer Luke tells us that Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary, were required to travel from Nazareth to their ancestral home in Bethlehem in Judea to register and be counted. So far then, we can say that Jesus was born after 8 BC. In addition, we can say that he was born not later than 4 BC. Why is that? Again, the New Testament gives us a clue. Matthew's Gospel shows that the birth of Jesus took place while Herod was king of Judea. It's established from secular records that Herod ruled from 37 to 4 BC. So Jesus was born at the time of a Roman census and shortly before Herod died. That's to say, Jesus was born around 4 BC. Now you might ask, how did the Western world come to adopt a system of counting time in terms of before and after the birth of Christ if he was born BC? Where did the idea come from of dividing time into AD, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, and BC, before Christ? Surprisingly, it wasn't until 526 that a Scythian monk, Dionysius Exiguus, living in Rome, came up with this method of Christian dating. And it wasn't until a thousand years later, in the 1500s, that BC came into use. It gradually became a common misconception that Christ was born at the division of the years between BC and AD. But the few historical benchmarks given in the New Testament give no support to such a conclusion. Here in Jerusalem, it's claimed that 2,000 years of Christian history are being commemorated. But since we know that Jesus was not born in 1 AD, the year 2000 has nothing to do with the 2,000th anniversary of his birth. Not only has the year of his birth been miscalculated, but so has the day. Many people now admit that December 25th could not have been the day of his birth. Most likely, Jesus was born in the autumn. We could make a strong case for this general period from specific details in the Gospel of Luke. The priests who served at the temple in Jerusalem had well-defined cycles or rotations. John the Baptist's father was one of those serving in Jerusalem from time to time. He served in the rotation named after Abijah, 
head of one of the priestly families in the days of King David. The timing of the Abijah course was around July, August. The Gospel of Luke tells us that John the Baptist was conceived just after one such visit by his father to Jerusalem. And we also know from Luke that John was about six months older than Jesus. So we can show by simple arithmetic that John the Baptist was born in the springtime in Palestine and that Jesus was born about six months later. As we continue with this history of early Christianity, we'll discover several more important misconceptions and we'll show why these discrepancies are significant. Let's now look at some of the other myths that have arisen around Christ's birth itself. First, some background. Joseph and Mary were living here in Nazareth when the Roman census was announced. They would have had a difficult time getting to Bethlehem. Mary was almost full term in her pregnancy, and the journey would have taken four to five days. The couple probably took the usual route from Nazareth to Nain, crossing to the east bank of the Jordan River, until they reached the region of Jericho. There they crossed the river again and ascended almost 4,000 feet to Jerusalem. Even today, this is a long climb. In the early autumn, it would have been a hot and uncomfortable journey along a much narrower and steeper road. With most of the long trek behind them, Joseph and Mary as parents-to-be would be pleased just to catch a view of Jerusalem's buildings gleaming in the sun. When Joseph and Mary finally arrived here in Bethlehem, in the birthplace of Israel's most famous king, David, they found that the census had brought many people home. That meant rooms were scarce as people came back to the place of their birth. Luke tells us that when Joseph and Mary arrived, there was no room for them in the inn. Where was Jesus born? No one knows for sure. If it was in a stable, it could have been in one of the caves in these hillsides. Apparently, they were used as stables at the time. In fact, the second century church historian Justin Martyr lends some credibility to this when he says, when the child was born in Bethlehem, since Joseph could not find lodging in that village, he took up his quarters in a certain cave near the village. Let's go and take a look at one of the caves. This is the kind of place that could have been a stable at the time Jesus was born. In fact, it's still being used as a stable today. Let's go inside. You can see inside that this would be the place where animals could have been protected at night and certainly kept warm and safe in the wintertime. Up here on the ceiling or the roof of this cave, you can see markings from smoke where probably the shepherds have had a fire. If indeed this was the kind of place where Jesus was born, it certainly would have been a very humble circumstance. It's interesting too that it was shepherds who first heard about his birth and they heard about it from angelic beings. In the 17th century, Rembrandt captured the intensity of the experience in the contrast of light and dark of this pen and brush creation. In the fields near Bethlehem, the Gospel of Luke tells us shepherds were living out in the fields, watching over their flocks by night. This is another clue that Jesus' birth was not in the middle of winter. 
when shepherds and flocks do not stay out in the fields at night. It does snow sometimes in Bethlehem. The angels told the shepherds that the Christos, or Messiah, the long-awaited savior of mankind, had come. The sign the shepherds should look for was a baby lying in an animal's feeding trough. They found the child and his parents exactly as predicted. The shepherds' astonishment at the accuracy of the angelic message was so overwhelming that they became the first humans to announce Jesus' birth. Other details of this account also have been misunderstood. Notice that the New Testament record says nothing about how many wise men came. Yet tradition tells us that there were three of them. This is in one sense a minor point, but it illustrates the imprecise way the details have been treated. If we can't get these simple facts correct, what about the more complex matters of faith and practice? Tradition further confuses the account by making the three men kings, as we can see in this Rembrandt sketch from 1632. But apparently the three kings theme only became popular in the Middle Ages, perhaps because three gifts are mentioned, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Rembrandt and other artists perpetuated the misconception about three kings by showing three visitors in regal clothing from the east. But the New Testament record is silent about the Magi as kings. Tradition takes another step in the wrong direction by teaching us that the Magi visited Jesus at his manger. Notice that Matthew's Gospel states quite different facts about where the Magi visited Jesus. The star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. These visitors came to see a child in a house, not a newborn in a stable. And once again, we see how easily the simplest facts are distorted. And yet, we wouldn't allow such looseness with the histories of other people. During his subsequent years in Galilee, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. Luke records that Jesus returned to Nazareth and was obedient to his parents. We know that Joseph was a builder. The word for carpenter in the New Testament is translated from a Greek word, tekton, but it means more than carpenter. It means a general contractor. In those days, houses and buildings were built primarily from stone. So Joseph would have used indigenous materials and local techniques. This gives us a glimpse into another common misconception. Traditional art often portrays Jesus as a soft, weak-looking man with long hair. Yet the historic records suggest that young Jewish men of that period did not have long hair. And the context suggests that Christ was a strong, masculine builder. His work must have taken him around the environs of Nazareth. A discovery near Jesus' boyhood home allows us to speculate reasonably about his youth and what he might have learned as a builder's apprentice. This is what remains of Sepphoris, a regional capital of Galilee in the first century. Herod Antipas ruled Galilee after his father, Herod the Great, died. He began an extensive building program here. It was a city under reconstruction during Jesus' youth. So this was a site of Herodian government at the time. And over there, about four miles away, is the city of Nazareth. It's quite possible that artisans from there came here to work as Herod Antipas began to rebuild this place. Herod and his brother Archelaus had spent significant time in Rome before he came here. So it's not surprising that this city is built in the Roman architectural style with baths and amphitheater and government buildings. 
If Jesus did spend a significant amount of time here, he would have learned about urban life, about politics, about government, about trade, and so on. Originally, the wall running at this point, so I strongly suspect that they found the top of the wall. Archaeologist James Strange has excavated large parts of Sepphoris since 1983. It was a um, very striking, beautiful city, uh, which they made deliberately out of the local white chalk limestone. Everywhere we get in the first century, it looks like that. Some buildings were faced with thin sheets of marble, so up close they would look very luxurious. It would be a thriving place. Would Jesus have come to Sepphoris? Um, if Jesus' family, Joseph, was a carpenter or whatever exactly he was, uh, it would be natural for him to just walk over to Sepphoris, takes about 45 minutes or an hour, looking for work. He would appear at the major market, say, you know, I'm looking for work, waiting for somebody to come by. Uh, take his sons with him then as they come along. If they have to go buy tools, it's natural to buy them in Sepphoris. If they need to sell anything that the family has produced, even weaving, it would be natural to go to Sepphoris and sell it in market day because there's always a flow back and forth between the villages and the top archies. And uh, Sepphoris is a top archy. It's, it administrates this whole territory. And so we might say capital, but I guess the technical term is really top archy. So uh, people are going to go back and forth all the time. So I think the most reasonable assumption is that he would come unless something intervened. The Greek word tekton is translated in the Bible in the New Testament as carpenter. Uh, is that a sufficient translation? Well, it's a broader term than we usually give it credit for. I think what happened was when the uh, Latin translators translated into the Latin, they chose the word carpenter, and that sort of stuck in Western culture. If you look at the Greek term carefully, it means any kind of artisan. But if they say tecton and they mean builder, then he works in uh, stone, he works in wood, he works in whatever he needs to to build. And houses are certainly not made of wood. They're made of stone. Does archaeology prove the Bible true? That's a good question. I guess what the Bible does is teach us about our relationship with God. What archaeology does is on occasion substantiate the side remarks that the Bible makes about material culture and how people lived and where people lived and so forth. So it doesn't say anything about how we, archaeology doesn't say anything about how we relate to God, <laughs> but it does uh, provide the context also for understanding the Bible. I think that's uh, something we can't do without. And so we now have a different perspective of what Christ's day-to-day -day life might have been like. Undoubtedly, his experiences living near this cosmopolitan city were far more than those suggested by traditional views of a carpenter's son growing up in a tiny, isolated village. As we're discovering, misconceptions and misunderstandings seem to typify common knowledge about early Christianity. The life of John the Baptist is a case in point. John's life paralleled Jesus' own in various ways. Their mothers were related. The New Testament tells us that both John's mother Elizabeth and Jesus' mother Mary conceived miraculously within a few months of each other. Elizabeth knew that her pregnancy was as much a remarkable sign of divine intervention as Mary's. Elizabeth had been unable to bear children until her old age. When Mary and Elizabeth met in the early days of Mary's pregnancy, Elizabeth's child had moved suddenly in the womb. Elizabeth took this as very meaningful. Certainly for a time, John was more controversial than Jesus. Unfortunately, Hollywood has portrayed him as a wild-eyed, disheveled religious fanatic. But John's message was anything but odd or unbalanced. What does the New Testament have to tell us? Given the historical and geographical context, Luke writes, 
Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. The result was that John the Baptist began publicly proclaiming that personal repentance of sin before God was essential. Baptism by immersion in water would begin the renewal process. And here again we strike another common misconception. It's often thought today that baptism means sprinkling an infant with water. Children shortly after they're born are taken to churches and a priest or a minister will sprinkle them with a little bit of water on the forehead and give them their name. Now this is a direct contrast to what the Bible means by baptism. Rather than the sprinkling of water on a child's head, which is what occurs at baptism of children or at christening, the Bible speaks about baptism by immersion. The word baptize comes from baptizo, which means to fully immerse in water. That's something that's only done to adults and only after they've made a complete and serious commitment to change their lives before God. One of our modern misunderstandings is that sin and guilt are outmoded concepts. Sin is an unfashionable word in our time. Have we perhaps reached the point where we find it difficult to say that anyone is really guilty of anything? That sin even exists? After all, psychotherapy has taught us to make patients out of sinners. People no longer sin. They're victims of the past, or their parents, or the system. But Western civilization's teachings tell us otherwise. The Bible says we do sin. And if as a result we feel guilty, that's mostly a good thing. Guilt can be good for us if it leads to change behavior through God's forgiveness. In the first century, John's message about washing away sins was new, though the Jewish people of the time did understand that by immersion, you could achieve ritual purification. Across the River Jordan opposite Jericho is one of the possible sites of John's baptizing work. Both Jesus and John traveled and taught in this area. In fact, the Gospel of John says that they were together here at one point. It's also close to Mount Nebo from where Moses saw the Promised Land. Some believe that the prophets Elijah and Elisha worked in this area as well. In the first century, this was the territory of Perea, where Jews lived at the time. Today, it's in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. This oasis on the east bank of the Jordan has been associated with John the Baptist for centuries. Jordanian archaeologist Mohammed Wahib has been excavating here since 1997. According to the Gospels, John baptizing in three places. First in Bethany beyond the Jordan, and second in Jordan River, and thirdly in Enon near to Salem. So we are now in Bethany beyond the Jordan, the exact place where John the Baptist started his mission and preaching in the wilderness. So this site is located between major sites, Jerusalem is to the west, Jericho, and also Mount Nippo there, Dead Sea around five miles from here to the south. So John the Baptist chose a strategic point between all these sites. Here the Byzantines came and they recognized the site of baptism, the site of John the Baptist. We have here in the hill uh, they built a monastery and dated back from the 4th to the 6th century. And also we have the inscription as mentioned above. It's dedicated to uh, Jesus the Christ. And the black stone here is possibly represent the fiery chariot which is ascended to the heavens from here depending on the Old Testament in the second Kings. So we're making a connection between John the Baptist here and Elijah here. Exactly because John the Baptist came with the spirit of Elijah. There is a real connection between John the Baptist and Elijah. So you're saying this, this could be the brook we call in English Cherith? Exactly. That's what was mentioned in the Old Testament. So Elijah was a refugee in this valley. And also John the Baptist was a refugee in this valley. And even Jesus the Christ, when he escaped and went beyond the Jordan, here to this place. So three of them came here and lived in this valley as refugees. 
It's unlikely, of course, that John baptized exclusively in one location. His ministry covered a wide area. In fact, the New Testament mentions more than one place where he worked. There's no question that John was a fiery preacher. He was not afraid to tell his audiences what he thought they needed to hear. When some came from Jerusalem and Judea to listen to him, he identified amongst them some from the religious leadership. He told them quite plainly that they were a brood of vipers. He warned them that divine retribution will come to all of the unrepentant, that complacency is a trap and that a show of religiosity is not sufficient. What God is looking for is a true change of heart. In this respect, John's mission was not unlike that of the Old Testament prophets. His prescription for behavioral change was the same. When asked for advice on how to practice righteous living, John would reply with specifics such as, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. The much hated tax collectors also sought his advice. To them he said, don't collect any more than you're required to. Then the soldiers would come and ask, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Share your goods, don't take more than you should, don't intimidate people or accuse them, and be content with your wages. These sound like prescriptions for today, and the reason they do is because John is basing his teaching on the timeless Hebrew scriptures. And that's something we'll notice about early Christian teaching, its timelessness. The kind of discussion John had with his audiences led some to wonder whether he were the anticipated Messiah. Could he be the Christos to come? John's answer was emphatic and at the same time puzzling. He said, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Whoever John was speaking of had not yet been revealed, but soon Jesus came to John to be baptized. John's reaction was, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus asked him to go ahead and perform the ceremony because he was going to set an example for all of humanity. Sooner or later, we must all come to accept or reject purification before God. What happened next is explained in all four gospel accounts. As Jesus came up out of the Jordan's waters, what appeared to be a dove descended on him. It was a symbol of the Holy Spirit, and a voice was heard saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. After this simple but profound ceremony, Jesus, at the age of 30, began his public work. And here again, we come upon a misconception that has taken hold in the modern world. That is, that the evil force is abstract that there really is no such being as the devil or Satan. What happened immediately following Jesus' baptism calls that idea into question. He was now led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness of Judea, a barren and inhospitable place there, he was approached by an opponent from another world. After fasting for 40 days, Jesus was met by Satan himself. Matthew records the devil's first line of attack. He said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. The craving for food was no doubt intense, and Jesus knew of his own miraculous powers. Was this an opportunity to use them for his own benefit? His reply to Satan was simple. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The tempter then made two more appeals to Jesus' personal power. Why not throw yourself from the highest point on the temple's walls? Surely God will save you. After all, you could prove who you are by taking what could be a suicidal leap because the scriptures promise your protection. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone, said the tempter. 
But Jesus knew that testing God's protection in that way would be willful and wrong. His response, you shall not test the Lord your God. Finally, the devil took Christ to a high mountain and surveyed the kingdoms of the world. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. His offer was seductive in the sense that Jesus knew his destiny to be the ultimate rulership of the world, but only on his father's terms, not as Satan's slave. His reply was final. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The New Testament teaches that Satan is a real being with real power in this present world. He's not a figment of the religious imagination. He's to be resisted as Jesus demonstrated. Shortly after this confrontation with the adversary, Jesus performed his first miracle. Once again, we strike a common misconception, this one concerning the use of alcohol. Many have been taught that drinking alcohol is a sin. Is that what Jesus taught? Here at Cana in Galilee, Jesus, his mother, and his disciples were invited to a wedding. During the feast, the supply of wine ran out. Mary mentioned this to her son. Jesus' reaction shows that she thought that he could do something about it, but that he preferred not to, to avoid too much notoriety. He said to her, Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants to help Jesus in whatever way he asked. Six stone jars were filled with water to the brim. Miraculously, they became 120 to 180 gallons of wine. And make no mistake about it, it was wine. The Greek word oinos means fermented grape juice. The steward of the feast was pleasantly surprised. He went to the bridegroom and told him, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. The idea that Jesus would turn water into wine offends some, but that's what the New Testament teaches just as it teaches that drunkenness is a sin. From Cana on the upper plateau of Galilee, Jesus and his family and disciples traveled down to Capernaum at the northern end of the Sea of Galilee, where he would eventually set up a home. The popular notion is that Jesus was a kind of itinerant with no home, that he and his disciples were down and out, living from hand to mouth. Yet the record clearly shows that at times he lived in a house in Capernaum. At this time, John was still baptizing by the River Jordan. A dispute arose between some of his disciples and members of the public about purification. They also noted that Jesus was now beginning to baptize. John took the position that this signaled his own work would now diminish and Jesus' work would increase. In telling the story about John and Jesus, the political environment of the time is often glossed over. John would soon be taken prisoner by Herod. What was it that caused his imprisonment? A couple of incidents in the Gospel account by John provide commentary on what has become a serious problem in today's world. Here we find a contradiction between the actions of many who claim to practice Christianity and what Jesus actually taught. John had been forthright in criticizing Herod for his marriage to his brother's wife. It was an adulterous relationship. It was well known, and it was against the law of God. The world today is not much different. In fact, it's rife with marital infidelity. Herod's adulterous relationship with his brother's wife was the catalyst for John the Baptist's outcry. Herod Antipas used it as an opportunity to imprison John here at Macarus in the mountains on the eastern bank of the Dead Sea. This was one of his father, Herod the Great's, defensive fortresses. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, 
It was Herod Antipas's suspicious mind that led him to bring John here and put him in prison. Apparently, he feared that John's popularity might lead to a rebellion against him. So he brought John here and later beheaded him. What happened in this fortress played an important part in the timing of Christ's own ministry. The Gospel writer Mark tells us that after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. This was the signal for Jesus to begin his ministry in earnest. It was in his hometown of Nazareth that Jesus announced his mission. Luke writes, so he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The word synagogue means both an assembly and a building. What the building was like is disputed. When visitors come to Israel today, they're often shown these ruins at Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee to demonstrate the surroundings of Jesus' time. However, this synagogue is from the third century. It's often casually assumed that this must be where Jesus spoke. But this is a later building constructed over the top of what is thought to be an earlier synagogue. And this is all assumption. What the original synagogue looked like is anybody's guess. In any case, it was the assembly that was more important. We come to the same consideration when we look at the New Testament word for church, the Greek there is ecclesia, which means the called out ones or the assembly. What Jesus had to say that day to the people in Nazareth and the synagogue was important. It was the time when he defined what his future work would be. He read the following from the book of Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. These words capture the ever-present human dilemma, how to heal the brokenhearted, how to set the oppressed free, how to cure spiritual blindness. At first, Jesus' listeners were impressed. They liked what he had to say. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? And yet when he told them that a prophet is without honor in his own country, they became angry and upset. His reputation for miracles had preceded him and they expected him to solve their every problem, both personal and political. They were an oppressed people looking for good health, as well as political freedom from the Romans. When Jesus refused to be the kind of leader they wanted, they were upset. Luke tells us they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of a hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. This early incident in Jesus' ministry reflects the tension he often generated. On the one hand, gracious speech. On the other, uncompromising moral logic that cornered his listeners. Another misconception that has plagued Christianity for a long time is that Jesus somehow came to do away with his father's law. Here at the northern end of the Sea of Galilee is where he delivered the famous Sermon on the Mount, perhaps over here on what is called the Mount of Beatitudes. What he said in that sermon revealed the deeper spiritual implications of the law. He did not do away with the law. He showed how it could be better kept. The scribes and Pharisees of the time, of course, had their own interpretations of the law, and that is what Jesus sought to correct. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus pointed out that his purpose was to uphold and magnify the law of God, not to make it of less effect. He said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The phrase, the Law and the Prophets, in one sense comprises all of the Hebrew Scriptures, what Christians refer to as the Old Testament. That's an unfortunate term, Old Testament, because it privileges the New Testament 
in a way that can debase the value of the scriptures that Jesus Christ himself used to great effect in his teaching. The old part of the Old Testament is simply a reference to the covenant agreement God made with ancient Israel at Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given. The new part of the phrase New Testament is a reference to the new relationship available with Jesus Christ for all of mankind. It gives us access to the Father and it also provides us with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just because we use the word old in describing the Old Testament doesn't mean that the Old Testament is redundant. In fact, Jesus plainly said about the Scriptures, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. This is an unequivocal statement. Jesus could not have been plainer about the centrality of God's law in human life. In Jesus' day, some of those who taught the law were Pharisees. If they were listening to the Sermon on the Mount, they heard a message that cut straight to the heart. On the other hand, if they would change, Jesus promised a significant future. He said, whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Then, in a direct reference to the hypocrisy of the religious leadership of the day, Jesus said, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. These religious leaders were not living up to the spiritual implications of the law. They were keeping the letter, but not the spirit. From there, Jesus went on to explain that murder begins in the heart, that adultery begins in the same place. In all of these cases, he was expanding on the law and showing its deeper spiritual implications. Not only is the act of murder wrong, the attitude of anger and scorn behind it is wrong. In such a frame of mind, a person cannot have a right relationship with God. First, we must reconcile with our neighbor. Only then will God hear us. Jesus was stressing that what goes on inside our heads is equally as important as the act of sin, because thought precedes action. It's at the level of conscious thought that sin begins. It ends in wrongful action. The undiluted strength of the young rabbi's teaching wasn't easy to take. His habit of getting to the heart of things was at once refreshing and challenging. He was obviously cut from different cloth than the traditional teachers. Throughout his ministry, he was consistently opposed by many in the religious leadership. The number of misconceptions we've discovered in this journey through the Gospels is a surprise to many people. But there's an even greater shock in store when we consider the events of the last week of Jesus' life, especially those surrounding His death and resurrection. When the women who had seen Jesus' crucifixion and burial came to the tomb on Sunday morning, they found nothing. This is a tomb of the kind that was extant in the first century in Jerusalem. You notice that the great round stone is rolled back from the entrance just as it was on that Sunday morning. Where the misconception arises is in believing that Jesus was resurrected on Sunday morning. The only sign or proof that Jesus said he would give of his Messiahship was the sign of the prophet Jonah. What was that sign? Jonah had spent three days and three nights inside a great fish. Jesus said that he would be three days and three nights buried in the heart of the earth. The problem is that three days and three nights cannot be fitted into the traditional Friday to Sunday Easter calendar. Yet Jesus said that the only sign of his Messiahship would be his burial for three days and three nights. Part of the difficulty lies in how we measure a day. In biblical times, a day was reckoned from sunset to sunset. 
Today, we think of a day from midnight to midnight. The truth of the matter is that Jesus participated in the Last Supper on a Tuesday evening. He was tried during the first part of Wednesday and crucified later in the day, dying late in the afternoon. If he was the Messiah, he would have to be alive again 72 hours later, that is, by early evening on Saturday. That's three days and three nights. The evidence is found by combining the Gospel accounts. So obviously then, when the women came on Sunday morning, Jesus was already gone. And here again, at the heart of traditional Christianity, is a huge misconception. Good Friday was not the day of Christ's crucifixion, and Easter Sunday was not the day of His resurrection. If the experts can get it so wrong in matters of simple counting, what might they have got wrong in the more important aspects of faith and belief? So maybe Kierkegaard was not so wrong after all when he said that the Christianity of the New Testament simply does not exist. The English writer G.K. Chesterton expressed it a little differently when he said, the Christian ideal, it is said, has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. It's in the practice of Christianity that the real discussion has to take place. Well, we've certainly covered a lot of ground today, and much of what we've said has been controversial, and it may have caused you to have some questions. It comes as a shock, after all, to discover that Christmas has nothing to do with the authentic birth of Christ. Men like Kierkegaard, Elul, and Chesterton are some of the few who have faced up to the contradictions between what the Bible says and the practice of modern Christianity. One man once said that people stumble over the truth pick themselves up and go on as if nothing had happened. Hopefully, we can be a little more honest about these things than that. Thanks for joining me today for this special presentation on The First Christians. I'm David Hume.